But um, we want to welcome you all here today for Bad an Hour with Katie Hood. Katie is the CEO of the One Love Foundation. We are thrilled to have her here with us today, um, particularly given the busyness of this week for everyone. Um, as I said in our promotional messages, we are just on the heels of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And so it's all the more fitting that we have Katie with us today. Who is her, she is um, herself a former policy student and we're thrilled to have her. And I'm going to turn it over to our Batten student, Martha Gallagher, who is going to introduce her to us today. And we appreciate Martha who works, does student work for One Love Foundation for suggesting Katie and for being her introducer. Thank you, Martha. Thank you so much, Dean Rockwell. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, this Baton Hour is extremely special to me as I've been a volunteer for the One Love Foundation since I was young. And I was the president of Team One Love at UVA last year. Um, so now I have the amazing opportunity to kind of merge my passions for Baton and One Love uh, with this event. And for those of you who don't know, the One Love Foundation started in 2014 in honor of Yardley Love, who was a UVA fourth year student and varsity lacrosse player who was killed by her ex-boyfriend in 2010. So now the foundation works to prevent similar tragedies by educating young people about the warning signs of unhealthy and abusive relationships. And a big part of that is our speaker today, Katie Hood, who is the chief executive officer of the One Love Foundation, a position she's held since 2014. Um, under her leadership, the organization has become the nation's leading educator of young people on the topic of healthy and un unhealthy relationships as both a primary prevention strategy for relationship abuse and as an investment in the relationship health of the next generation. Um, One Love's award-winning film-based peer-to-peer educational workshops have reached over 1.1 million young people in person and over 100 million people have engaged with One Love's educational campaigns online. Um, I was able to get to know Katie last year through my involvement with, with the One Love Foundation and I've personally seen the impact that she has on other volunteers and leaders throughout the organization. And her dedication to One Love inspires all of us to work harder to spread the organization's mission. So she's very loved in the One Love Foundation. Um, and prior to joining One Love, Katie was the chief executive officer at the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research, where for nine years she worked to drive research progress towards a cure for Parkinson's disease. Katie also worked as a philanthropic consultant and served as a visiting lecturer at Duke University's Stanford School of Public Policy. Um, before discovering her passion for philanthropy, she held positions at both Goldman Sachs and Bain and Company. Katie is a passionate dynamic speaker who has appeared at TED, Aspen Ideas Health Milken Global Conference, Fortune's Most Powerful Women Conference, and the Nantucket Project. She is frequently quoted as an expert on dating violence and healthy relationships in national media outlets from ABC News to Teen Vogue. Katie received her bachelor's degree in public policy from Duke University and MBA from Harvard Business School. She currently serves on the Dean's Board of Advisors for Harvard Business School and the President's Advisory Council of Concordia College and has served on the advisory board of the National Institutes of Neurological Disease and Strokes at the NIH and as an advisor to the Institute of Medicine at the National Academy, Academies in Washington, DC. So Katie, thank you so much for being here and offering your time. We're all very much looking forward to this next hour and I can't wait to hear everything you have to say. Thank you so much, Martha and Dean Rockwell. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I I'm gonna sort of, my goal today basically is to first talk to you. Um, I was an undergrad public policy student many moons ago. I didn't know what I was gonna do. And while Martha just shared my bio, which now is getting long because I'm old, um, I wanna tell you a little bit about what I was thinking at different path, at different points in my life as my career evolved. It all sounds amazing in the rear view mirror, but it didn't always go in like a linear way. And I think that's really important for you guys to understand. Obviously, I want to spend time talking about One Love and why I am really passionate about this work um, and why I think it's going to change the world. And then I thought just like thinking back through um, I, when I taught at Duke, when I was a visiting lecturer there, I taught a class on leadership. And one of the best things I would have people Skype in or Zoom into my classroom um, who were, had all done great things but couldn't get down to Durham. So sort of like a session like this. 
And they would always share their lessons learned. So I'm going to do a little bit of sharing my lessons learned along the way. Maybe some of them are relevant to you, but I do want to save, you know, at least like 30 minutes for Q and A. If you have questions, any question is good. Um, so just a little bit. I, be, before I graduated from Duke, I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, I think from a very early age, I always wanted to work to have a positive impact. Um, I didn't really know what that meant. I did learn early on that I really liked rallying people to do things. Um, so I took on a lot of leadership positions in both um, high school and then college. Although when I got to Duke, I was very intimidated. Suddenly it was a very small fish in a very big pond. But by the time I was a junior and senior, I'd found my footing again. And what I really found is I, I really loved to lead, but not because, oh, I had the title, because I really liked working with people to get things done. Um, like many, I had no idea what I was going to do uh, in my life. I saw a very limited set of paths. I think when I was in college, Duke was a pretty pre-professional school. And it was like, you can be a banker, a consultant, a doctor. We didn't have Teach for America at the time, but that would have been there. Um, so it was pretty easy to go drop resumes. So I dropped resumes. I thought I'd be the world's best consultant. I got no consulting jobs. Um, and then I got a job at Goldman Sachs, which everybody was truly stunned by as I was not a public policy econ grad. I hadn't had any fancy internships. I'd been a camp counselor every summer, um, but I got a job at, in the analyst program at Goldman Sachs working in the credit department. And I decided to do that. I had a fair amount of anxiety about that. I knew nothing about the markets. I knew nothing about investment banking. Um, but I was determined to do it and determined to learn. Um, I, I realized pretty quickly when I got up to New York that um, banking was absolutely not what gave me oxygen. That's a phrase I've come to in my life that I'll come back to, but I just felt like going to work every day. There was a million other people behind me in line for this job that would have liked it more, that got energy from it, that were just as qualified. I just happened, I knew it was wrong almost from the time I was there, even though the people I was working with were incredible and it really was like professional boot camp to learn to go from being a college student to learning to operate at Goldman Sachs. But I always knew I was going to, I wanted to get through the analyst program so that I could say that I had, but that I was going to be moving on. So at the end of two years, I actually went back to Duke. I thought I might want to be a professor um, and I wanted to test out what it would be like to work in an academic environment. And again, and this is a trend you'll see in, in, with me. Within months, I realized that was not giving me oxygen either, that there was something about, um, I was more motivated again by working with people uh, than I was. And I should mention when I was a student at Duke, there's a handful of professors, but one in particular who radically changed my life. So made me see myself not as a small unworthy little fish, but actually boosted me up and helped me grow. And when I went back to work at Duke, that specific professor was going through the tenure process. And this is a person who had really changed my life. And I saw what a hard time he was having getting tenure because he focused more on teaching than publishing. And I realized that was not, I didn't want to be in that kind of environment. So I applied to business school. I was fortunate enough. I, I applied to HBS, Harvard Business School as a long shot. Um, when my dad read my essays, he literally said to me, are you sitting down? And I said, why? And he said, are you applying to social work school or business school? And I said, I'm not changing anything, dad. So I applied to the Kennedy School at Harvard and I applied to the business school. I thought I was a shoe in for the Kennedy School. I thought I'd never get into the business school. I got rejected out of hand at the Kennedy School and I got in without an interview to the business school. So who knows, who knows, who knows? Um, I guess the point there is just try, you never know how your path's gonna unfold. Um, pretty much did the same thing when I was at, I loved business school, loved it. I would go again any second. Some of my closest friends came out of that experience. But when it came time to getting a job, I had tons of student loans. And um, while I was super interested in the nonprofit sector at this point, I'd been in the social enterprise club um, and was really thinking about the social sector as somewhere I might wanna end up, um, I needed to pay my bills. So I finally got that consulting job I thought I'd be perfect for. I went to Bain. I loved the culture at Bain, but within a couple months, I realized this wasn't what I wanted to do either. So you see this recurring theme of testing lots of different things and figuring out how to get closer and closer to what's right. So here's where the story starts. So by the time I was 28, I think I'd had three jobs and spent two years in um, business school, which most people would say, oh, that's too much jumping around. And not anymore. In the old days, now everybody jumps around. But um, then I had my first opportunity to move into the nonprofit sector. My biggest concerns with nonprofits were I had a stereotype that many were bureaucratic 
And my time at Goldman and my time at Duke, which was a little slower, showed me I liked a faster paced thing. So I specifically went, and the nonprofit search is really hard to do. It's not like dropping a resume in a very orderly process. It's a lot more word of mouth. So I started calling people I knew to say, I want like a high impact, fast paced nonprofit that's really focused on something important. And um, th this person recommended two organizations. One was the Robin Hood Foundation, which is pretty well known in New York. Um, and the other was this new startup called the Michael J. Fox Foundation. I was not at all interested in the Michael J. Fox Foundation. So I sent my resume and cover letter into Robin Hood and they never called me back. Um, they were already sort of 10 years in, they had their team, but Michael J. Fox was brand new. And so I got a call back from the CEO pretty quickly. We went for coffee and at the end of 30 minutes, she said, oh, you should just work here. Do you wanna raise money or do you wanna spend money? So um, I did not wanna raise money, which that's also very funny because that's what I've now done a lot of my life doing, but I said, I wanna spend money. So I ended up on the program team, what, figuring out how to allocate dollars for the best Parkinson's research. So I was there nine years. I did spend the last three and a half there as CEO. Um, that was a job I had to be offered twice. So I tell that uh, because I'm very lucky that it was offered to me the second time. Uh, the first time I had, I was pregnant with my second, I had a year and a half old son. And um, I said, I can't do it with everything that's going on on the family front. But what I realized is I was actually afraid. Um, and I, I like to talk very openly about this because you hear my resume rattled off and you think that person probably has never been afraid of anything. I didn't take the CEO job because I didn't think I could do it. There's, there's just no doubt that that's, when I look back, that's what was going on. But about a year later, the person they had hired didn't work out. Um, and Andy Grove, who was one of the founders of Intel, was one of our supporters and a, and a, and a mentor of mine. And he called to say, what's going on? Why is this person leaving? You know, he was a very brusque, uh, abrupt and brusque guy sometimes. And I said, she needs to go. She's not the right person here. We need to do a national search. And he said, I'm going to tell the board that you need to be the CEO. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I have two young kids. And he said, I'm not asking you for your opinion. I'm telling you what I'm telling the board. And I'm like, all right. So I did it on an interim basis. And I would say sometimes that's one of my lessons learned. You need to kick through the door. Um, and once you're there, you realize, oh my gosh, this is like the job I was born to do. And I loved every minute of that job. Um, I loved, Fo Michael J. Fox was really trying to figure out new ways to accelerate research progress by focusing on prioritizing research and really translational research. So getting from basic to clinical in faster ways. It was super creative. It required with working all with all kinds of expertise, but building a new model. And, and that's when I realized like I am a builder. So I get my oxygen from building things and trying things. And if it works, awesome, keep doing it. If it doesn't work, let's fix it and move on. And when I come back to this phrase of what gives you oxygen, that is what gives me oxygen, is the ability to sort of create, try, and at the, at the core really problem solve. So that, that brings me to One Love. But before I get to One Love, um, I was CEO of uh, Michael J. Fox till 2011. But in 2010, I had my third child and I was home on maternity leave. And I got a call on the morning of May 3rd, 2010 saying, you need to go to Sharon's house, her cousin's been killed. So I rushed in, and my weak old baby rushed down into the car, drove down the hill, walked in the front door of my friend Sharon's house. Um, and she was sitting uh, on the floor with her three young children around her. And she just mouthed the words to me, he broke down the door and he beat her to death. And I get chills every time I say that story. It brings me right back to the moment. Um, her cousin was Yardley Love. Um, I knew she had a cousin who was in, in college at UVA uh, because Sharon had played lacrosse when she was in college. And she was like, you know, always talking about her, her cousin's senior year and lacrosse. And they were texting all the time. They were very, they're quite close, even though they had a 13 year age difference. And I always tell the story because two things. For me personally, my mind went totally blank. I, this was not, when somebody said her cousin's been killed, I thought about car accidents and drinking and drugs and a head injury. And I thought about all that stuff. And I never thought about relationship abuse ever. Didn't even cross my head. And in that moment, all I could say to her was what, 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 what? It just was like not computing. It was like an overload of my brain. The other reason I tell that story is having been there day one, I can tell you that no one in her family, and I don't think her friends even truly understand understood the risk that she was in. 
it was like out of left field. And so the, those realizations that that can happen, something that extreme, I think when we see these stories in the media, we think, oh, it must have been bad for a long time. People had to have seen things. And the truth is, having been there that minute, it was very clear this was like nothing anyone had ever anticipated. Um, so as the time went on, because, well, actually within six weeks, Sharon Love, her mother, Lexi, her sister, um, and Sharon, her cousin, were in my office at the Michael J. Fox Foundation. I came in from maternity leave. They were starting a foundation and they wanted to learn how to do it well. So I brought my team together to give them advice. In every way, it was way too early to be having that meeting. But I, I tell you that because thus began a process of me trying to help them. Um, I think there are way too many nonprofits in the world and no offense, but like I really, my recommendation to them was figure out what you wanna do and if somebody else is doing it, join them. And if somebody else is not, figure out if you have the assets and capacity to do it yourself. It was very clear to me, having worked for Michael J. Fox, that Yardley was capturing the media attention in a way that was a really powerful platform um, and opportunity. And I don't mean that in a gross way. I'm just, if the, if the media, three women a day are killed in this country, um, but for whatever reason, I think because she was a division one college athlete and he was as well and UVA and, um, they defied your expectations of who this happens to. And so the media really jumped into it. And um, while they didn't really do anything around domestic, domestic violence for the first couple of years, coming out of the trial, at the trial, um, I remember them saying that a third of the jury pool was dismissed in Charlottesville because of a connection to domestic violence. And this hit her mother and her family very um, hard. It was this realization that the stats, which are one in three women, one in four men, and one in two trans or non-binary people will be in abusive relationships. It really brought home these stats are real. This is everywhere and nobody's talking about it. And I think over time, the way I like to say it is, nobody realized what they were seeing, but if a domestic violence expert had been dropped into the middle of their friend group, definite signs that this was intensifying and accelerating and more and more dangerous were there. So they emerged from the trial really saying, how do we teach young people in a language they can hear about this issue, show them the signs, let them know where to go for help so that this doesn't happen to other families. And Sharon Love got even a little bit more specific and really talked about how do we do for this issue what Mothers Against Drunk Driving did for drunk driving and really like raise awareness, change tolerance for it and change the statistics. And so that was what they decided to focus on um, in 2012, and which I was inspired by. I was like, oh, this is it. Nobody's doing this. And this is, I like big, big things like curing Parkinson's and ending domestic violence. I like really big challenges. But I could also see, I just knew having just gotten out of teaching at Duke, that nobody was talking to young people about this issue in the way that I thought we could. So in 2000, I became an advisor, but then in 2014, I became the first CEO after we created our first film, Escalation. And so um, now it, over the last six years, uh, I mean, it's been a crazy six years. We're now 42 people in six regions across the country. Um, we've engaged thousands and that we have 30, almost 30,000 trained facilitators of our programs. Um, we, we have a new training platform coming out where at any point in the day, anyone in the world can come on, log in and learn how to use our tools and go through like training and certification and all this so that anyone anywhere is empowered to bring this to the community as they care about. When I think about um, the big learnings we've had here, film is really powerful. It really accelerates, our, our films are mostly fic are all fictional. They're not documentaries. They are really fictional stories. And, and when you bring a group, you show them in a, in a room and the group watches, there's this first process of people realizing, oh, I've seen some of these things before. And I've come to think that domestic violence is one of those things that even when it's right in front of us, our human instinct is to call it something else, call it drama, call it too much drinking, not call it what it is, because the very idea that somebody who loves us could hurt us is like so fundamentally threatening that we just call it other things. But when you watch a fictional film, you're, and then we have our, everything we do is anchored to our 10 signs of healthy and unhealthy relationships. When we give people a language to describe what was previously coded in emotion, all of a sudden you're at a place where people can now talk the same language. 
And I think that's, in essence, I think that's the most important thing we're doing is we're destigmatizing the conversation. We're teaching friends. And now we go, we're actually developing an elementary school program on healthy friendships now, but, but we're really focused on middle school, high school, and college, um, healthy friendships and healthy uh, dating relationships. The same behaviors that are unhealthy in a dating relationship are unhealthy in a friendship. So we really believe that the, if we can teach these behaviors and this language early, that by the time you're dating, when the stakes can be higher and it can be more dangerous if it goes bad, you're going to see the signs right away and you're going to know this is not what you want. So that's the ultimate vision. Now that's going to roll out. I mean, we are doing a bunch of studies to show the um, effectiveness now of what we're doing. There's much more to be done on that front. But the reason I have oxygen around this work every day is because pretty much every day we hear of somebody who says that our program has saved their lives. And if it's not saved their lives, it's changed their lives. And um, so, th so that gives me confidence that we're on the right track. And then also just, you know, student leadership is a huge part of what we do. I, I think what we do is we light a little spark in people and give them the language and the tools to help themselves and their friends. And when I think about um, how powerful that is to actually be empowering thousands of people to help the people around them, it's a whole front line that's never been activated before. And that gets me really excited. I think the other thing, um, doing this work at this particular moment in our world is also has given me oxygen uh, because at the end of the day, while we were started to prevent what happened to Yardley from happening to others, the truth is relationship health is fundamental. And the research shows the health of your relationships will impact your mental health outcomes, your physical health outcomes, your Life, life outcomes, graduation rates, incarceration rates. So if when I think about like, we're just about to launch a, a relationship health campaign called Love is Learned next week. If we can start really early getting people to focus on their relationship health as the unit right in front of them that they can work on every day, when the world seems like everything's going crazy, what you can do and what you can bring is you can bring um, focus on healthy relationships to your life and then see what happens with that. So I love that there's now even bigger relevance. Um, I have an amazing team. I, like, I can't even believe the talent that we have gathered both at the volunteer level and also um, at our full-time level. You know, in response to everything that was happening this summer, one of our partners, the Harlem Children's Zone, asked us if we could do a racism and the 10 signs workshop. And my team is so, um, we want to work deeply with our partners and recognizing that, at, you know, you can oversimplify it, but clearly racism is partly about very, very unhealthy relationships. So they worked with the Harlem Children's Zone to create this pilot workshop. And I think we're going to have even greater demand for it. So having a team that is continues to be innovative and hardworking and really determined in this mission is incredible. So anyway, I'll pause. You can tell I get excited about this stuff. So, um, so my, what I want to say to you guys, I want to give you some learnings. Um, the things that when I thought about this presentation, what are the things that I learned at every way, at every step that sort of surprised me? Um, back to the, my favorite quote is uh, Howard Thurman. You don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is more people who are alive. We live in a world that, um, especially if you're at a school like UVA or Duke, where it's like, I remember when I taught at Duke, I asked people to write a paper, my students to write a paper on their identity. And fully a third of the people just wrote about being successful. And I think this chase for success is an empty chase. I really do. I think that if you find something you love and you dig in and that really matches you, I mean, this will get to my faith a little bit, which is maybe inappropriate, but I truly believe God put each one of us on this earth with our with our good things and our struggles with some sort of purpose and our job is to figure out what it is. When you figure out what it is, that's when, I mean, success will come as a result. It's, don't focus on success first. Um, I would say when I was sitting in your shoes, I thought I was behind because I hadn't figured it all out yet. You're not behind, like be in the moment where you are and try to make the next set of decisions the best that you can. Figure out what gives you oxygen, obviously. Um, don't be afraid to jump off the path. Everyone thought I was crazy to leave Goldman Sachs. I was doing well there. They were gonna send me international for a third year. My, my like ninth grade brother was like, um, 
are you dumb that you're leaving Goldman Sachs? Like you could make a lot of money. And I'm like, yeah, no, my heart is like shrinking here. It's like literally just disintegrating. It's not for me. Um, and when I jumped off the path, I was afraid. I was also afraid when I jumped off the path, when I left Michael J. Fox and I left after nine years and I was, I loved parts of it, but I had three kids at home. One of whom was struggling. I had, um, a lot of questions in my head about one of the things that had drawn me to the foundation was this idea of curing a disease in 10 years, which was really motivating to me. And I was in year nine. I was like, science is hard. I think we've got another 10 years. Am I here for the next 10 years? But when I left that Michael J. Fox that day, I realized how much of my identity was totally caught up in being like the woman who did it all, you know, the, um, you know, three kids, you know, running around like crazy, CEO of Michael J. Fox's foundation. And all of a sudden I left it and I didn't know who I was, but I found my, my place back to this, which is actually what I think I was put on this earth to do, to be perfectly honest. So don't be afraid of jumping off, trust your gut. I have all over my offices, really trust your gut, trust your gut, get to know yourself really closely and then tr learn to trust you. Um, nobody really taught me that. But I just know in my heart that that's part of what growing up needs to be about. I just know in my heart. Um, relationships are everything. So that's not just because from the one love perspective, one of the things I'm happiest about um, in terms of who I am in the world is that I'm, a, I'm such a relational person. I get energy from people. I love being with people. I love working with people. I stay in touch with people. I'm not like in great touch, but I'm the kind of person where you might not hear from me for six months and then you'll get a random call on a Saturday and we'll talk for 45 minutes. I, and the people that, with, when it comes to One Love, we had a great idea, we had no money really. So what it required was me going out to every relationship I'd ever made, asking people to back me and back this idea. And it's grown since then, it, it wasn't just me, there were some other people doing that too. It's grown much bigger now, we're up to a seven and a half million dollar budget, which was, you know, coming from, you know, 500,000 six years ago. But it is because of the relationships I have with people and the credibility I've built over the years with people that we were able to do that. Don't be afraid of asking for money. Um, I was so afraid of asking for money. And then it wasn't all of a sudden I was the CEO at Fox and it wasn't a choice. That's part of your job. I think if you believe I could only raise money for something I fully believe in. Um, I could never be just like a a fundraiser for something I didn't I didn't have my heart behind. But when I believe in something, I think it's a privilege to show people who have resources how to use their resources to change the world. Um, that doesn't mean I don't have some conversations where I'm like nervous they're going to say no. I've been said no to many times now. That's actually you. <laughs> it's it's never fun, but now you're used to it and you know what happens. Um, so don't be afraid of fundraising, but think about your own comfort zone. And again, what gives you what gives you oxygen or not? Um, you won't know if you're entrepreneurial until you try. So I did not think I was a startup person. It felt unsafe to me. I was sort of risk averse. And then I realized I'm a builder and building is inherently entrepreneurial, but I had to do it to realize how much I loved it. Um, and then my, my last one would be respect expertise but not too much. So the reason I love being in the nonprofit sector is I think that the nonprofit sector is the place, there needs to be way more risk-taking in the nonprofit sector. We inherently are trying to tackle the problems that the capitalistic system doesn't know how to fund, doesn't know how to do and make profit around. So we have to take risks. Uh, when I joined the Michael J. Fox Foundation, there were it was pretty much brand new. There were a lot of people who said, why is he starting his own foundation? And as a patient, he was starting his own foundation because he didn't think there was urgency enough in the other foundation. So he put this 10-year horizon on it. If we had 10 years to cure the disease, what would we do? And that mindset made us much more creative than the traditional experts had been. We developed a whole new model and we just, and it's the same thing with One Love. I mean, there's plenty of domestic violence organizations, many of whom we partner with, but what we felt was missing was like this large scale educational approach, mobilize young people, empower young people. And I say to my team all the time, that's our shot on goal. That doesn't mean the experts aren't expert in other things, but our shot on goal and the new expertise we're building is around this. So I think sometimes, I mean, people ask, I ran into somebody at a meeting who's known me through multiple parts of my life. And 
I said, yeah, so we're, it's like a whole new way to think about X, Y, Z. He's like, you've always been against experts. I want to be clear. I'm not against experts. I just think if the experts were 100% right, the problems would be solved already. So never underestimate what your own creativity and ingenuity can do um, to add to a situation. So I'm going to pause there because I've now been rambling on. Um, I do want to get you guys thinking about oxygen. We inherently know when we're in a class or a program or a job where we get oxygen from the world, and then we know what it looks like when we're getting it sucked out of us. So try to try to think about that as you take steps in your career. Um, and with that, I'll just pause and open it up for questions. Katie, thank you so much. I just want to share some comments from our Dean who is participating in the audience today. He said, your passion and leadership lessons are fabulous. Thank you for this great program and your lessons are highly resonant. I salute you for your courage, your clarity, your brilliance and your warm humanity. So nice. uh, we all thank agree you. and, thank, and you. thank you for these very inspiring words, which come at a time when I think a lot of us feel like we need some inspiration. So yeah. we appreciate yeah. that. Um, we do have a question. It says, um, I hope this doesn't come off as offensive, but I have a hard time identifying with the message because of who it comes from. The organization seems to have a lot of white and affluent Christians. Is that an incorrect assumption? How do you counter that? And more broadly, how do you think people in the non-profit space can be effective in reaching across lines of difference? White affluent Christians. Uh, well, so first of all, this is a great question um, and I'm not offended by it at all. So um, the it's actually a huge focus of our work for the last few years is on diversifying everything about what we do. Um, so, but let me start with where we started. I, I mentioned the media attention and there's no doubt that because Yardley was white and affluent, well, she wasn't affluent, but middle-class and at an elite school, that that's part of the reason the light was shown on to begin with. And we talk openly here that without that light and then without honestly, like somebody like me coming in with the network I had based on the communities I've been in before, we would never have gotten off the ground. So that's a very fair acknowledgement. But um, we will not succeed in our mission unless we become an, an everyone centered organization. And so what that looks like internally is um, really, 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 in, in, we're doing this whole belonging, diversity, equity and inclusion effort that we've been working on for two or three years, not just in the last six months about how do we diversify our content. So the vision is we did anchor the, the first few films definitely were white heteronormatively cisgendered focused, but now we're working on developing new content that represents other identities. Um, films are expensive, so we had to raise some more money before we could, but we now I think have four projects in place that will feature different kinds of couples, all anchoring to the 10 signs because one of the one of the things that we loved about, um, that we love about, the, about this issue, if you love anything about it, but um, it follows a human pattern. So this pattern of like, it starts out okay, but then you're isolated and emotionally abused. This is a pattern, no matter who you are, it just sometimes shows up a little differently in different people's realities. So our vision is to have a library of content someday that anyone anywhere can say, this is right for my community, this is right for my community, but that anchors and teaches the same language. So content is uh, definitely one thing. Um, I also think that our staff has actually become much more diverse. We were 100% white women four years ago. So again, I this is part of our process of changing as an organization. We are not, that's not who we are at all anymore. And in, in the field, we've actually shifted our focus away from private schools and universities to working with community groups, public schools, et cetera, because we know that getting to kids with this information young and getting to all kinds of kids is really important. I would not at all pretend that this is a this is this is going to be our ongoing effort. And it's not, none of this is like. We're changed overnight, but I'm super excited by the commitment of this team to this work. And I, I, I think, you know, I, I say to my to other people, like, you have to hold us accountable over the long haul. Like when I look at where we are now compared to three or four years ago, I know we're on the right path and we have more still to do. So in terms of how people in the nonprofit space can be more effective in reaching across lines of differences, it is 100% going in. And we've done this since the beginning. We have this movie. If it's useful, use it. And then if it's not useful, tell us why and tell us what you need. So one of the biggest things you have to do is sit in community with the groups you want to serve. And I very much think about us as um, servants. I think anyone in the nonprofit sector is a servant. 
And so going in and finding out what you need from us and then using that feedback to inform the next set of tools or next set of initiatives. Um, based on a couple of focus groups we did this summer with LGBTQ youth, we actually have um, put, put an LGBTQ toolkit out, which is how do you lead inclusive workshops? So there's some of our content is expensive to make and it takes a little longer, but along the way, in terms of diversifying our offerings, it's really based on what communities tell us that they need and then trying to respond to that. I don't know if that answered your question, but you're, but you're, I wanna say, you're absolutely right that um, that, when we when we started, people 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 always say, "Katie played lacrosse in college." I'm like, "No, I didn't. I didn't play lacrosse in college." Like they think about it as a white lacrosse affluent organization, and that is actively we are never going to get to our mission of changing the stats and norms around DV unless everybody can plug into our work. Um, Kay, I just have a we got a couple questions. I have a question, and like I said, I encourage our our participants to please use the Q and A feature to to pose more questions. Um, I guess I have a question in in you coming up to speed on sort of all the um, all the work that go the research that went into One Love's mission and their um, their trainings. What has surprised? What was surprised the most surprising to you to learn about domestic violence and relationship abuse? Um, I think that. I, I, I think two things. I think um, I really didn't realize the prevalence. Like the first time, I think sometimes when we, we read stats, they just like glaze over us. But when you think about one in three women, one in four men, one in two trans or non-binary folks, that's, that's a lot of people. Like, you know, th this is a massive epidemic that nobody's really been paying. Like there's a lot of people working on helping people who have been impacted, but trying to get upstream and change the issue has been significantly underfunded given, given how it impacts our world. Um, I would say the second thing that surprised me is just how damaging emotional abuse is. When I started this job and I would say those stats, um, people would say, well, well, what does that mean? I would say, well, it means physical abuse, sexual abuse, and emotional abuse. And more than one person would say, well, emotional abuse, what's that? And that's really what we've realized you have to focus on because emotional abuse is the stuff that's more visible frequently on the outside than some of the others. It's also the place um, emotional abuse has a long term more negative mental health impact on a, a survivor than does physical abuse. So we, it's, it's a particularly damaging time. It's also the place where we think people lose their footing. So when you've been um, isolated from your friends and you've been told that you're worthless or when you say, I wish you didn't do this and they blame it on you, it's this cycle of losing your footing and your trust in yourself and you're increasingly tethered just to one person. So it became really clear to us that we had to focus on this space because if we can teach people the signs in this space, maybe they can get out before unhealthy behaviors become abuse. Mm -hmm. And so I would say I really didn't under, I didn't understand how important the emotional abuse space was. And I also didn't realize how normalized emotional abuse is in our world. And so that's actively what we're trying to fight against. Martha, I know you have a question also. Yes, definitely. And by the way, Katie, I completely agree with that. I think that was one of the things that shocked me the most too, especially in speaking to different student organizations at UVA, like especially fraternities um, and hearing about how these young men don't really identify with the issue because they think that relationship abuse is only physical. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times they haven't quite experienced that, but they have mostly experienced emotional abuse. It's really interesting to have that conversation with people and help people realize that too. Yeah, I think that's a super good point. So one of the, so what's really clear, so unfortunately this issue has been put in like the women's issue category and certainly gender-based violence is a global concern, but to fix the problem, we have to engage men. And actually when you focus on emotional abuse, more men can relate as people who've experienced it. So it's not just like you do bad things. It's like, listen, you know, what, belittling how does this affect you and i think it brings people in i always say um you know the stats on abuse are terrible but a hundred percent of us will be in unhealthy relationships and a hundred percent of us will do unhealthy things which means this there's something for all of us in this definitely and i'm gonna read out some of the questions in the chat because i think they're really great questions um um someone said i have a teenage daughter who struggled with forming healthy relationships I love the fact that you're working on offerings for people 
it really can become a lifelong problem. Can you offer a particular, or can you recommend a particular One Love Foundation workshop for site, et cetera, for me to send my daughter to? Yep. Um, so I would love your thoughts too, Martha. Why don't you say, Martha, what do you think you would recommend based on what, do you think behind the post? Yeah, I think behind, so there's a smaller workshop called Behind the Post um, online and it focuses mostly on how our dependence on social media and our, this new kind of virtual world we live in can really impact relationships in, in, a, in a negative way um, and how your friends and things can, other people in your life can kind of realize the signs of these unhealthy relationships through your social media posts and um, things of that nature. So I think that's really great. Um, and I always think that, especially for teenagers, maybe in like middle school or high school, it's really important also to find a program that focuses on friendships as well as um, romantic relationships, because ultimately you're gonna make more friendships than you will, I think, romantic relationships in your life. And so if you have a good foundation for that, then you'll have a good foundation for any other relationship you make. Um, so I really like to focus on friendships as well. Yep, and I would also say if you go to, um, so our website is www.joinonelove.org, but if you do forward slash education dash center, um, this isn't, you can't get to this from our homepage, which is why I gave you that. This is where all of our trainings, it's our new um, like training platform, and you can see all of our content and lots of our resources on there. You just have to register and then you can go through them and you could even pick for yourself, um, but that's, that would be my recommendation. We got lots more questions coming in. Uh, let's see. It seems that one loves 10 signs of a healthy relationship also could be signs of a healthy community or a healthy democracy. Do you feel that your work is part of healing society more broadly? And if so, what forms of pedagogy do you think might be most valuable for intimate relationships and more broadly? So, um... I saw another question in chat about at what point do you shift an organization's scope without overextending? Mm -hmm. So I think these are sort of related. Right. Um, so, so the answer is for me as an individual, the answer is yes, I do. I, I, I think that this, I think, I think of relationships as the fundamental building blocks of community and society. I think that I saw another question in there about uh, racism and other things. I, I think that it's fractures in our relationships and our power dynamics that have caused many of the problems that we're, um, that we're experiencing and dealing with in our country and, and beyond. Um, we are very clearly an organization focused on relationship health with a mission of ending domestic violence and creating a world where we can love better. But is my great hope that in planting these seeds and getting this work started, that it has a cascading effect? Yes. But that's sort of out of bounds from a mission focus area. You're not going to see us. That, I'll give you a perfect example. The, um, the elementary school module is actually quite a heated discussion with our team because we are not in the business of educating elementary school students. That being said, as we traveled around, so many parents were drawing the link. Like, what can I do to talk to my second grader or third grader or fourth grader about this? So the decision we made is we're gonna make a module. We're not gonna spend time trying to get into elementary schools, but we're gonna put it on the educational center and we're gonna let people know, we build everything so that others can use and distribute it. So they'll know it's there. If they wanna use it, they can use it. So to me, that's not mission creep. We're not moving into elementary education, but it is an important tool to peg up there and let people use if they want to. Um, I might've gotten my questions. I was merging too many questions at once. Uh, did I answer that question? A little oh, more pedagogy. pedagogy. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I don't, can I confess? I don't even know how to really frame that. I'm such a like professor of the practice and not like a professor of like studies. So can you clarify a little bit more in the Q and A? Cause otherwise I'm just gonna screw it up. All right, we'll watch for some clarification. Let's see. Um, but yes, let's go with the, um, the question that you sort of hint, you also recognized the idea of um, addressing some of the underlying causes of unhealthy relationships, racism, white supremacy, toxic masculinity, et cetera. Well, I think this, this question, well, the, we've changed on this a little bit. So, um, and this will get to the first question that was asked about how we're changing as an organization. Um, when we started, I'm mean, gonna like really clearly, if I had known 
all, I told my husband when I took this job, I think it'll be like max eight people. Like it's totally manageable. We have one film, we'll get it out there for everybody. If I'd known the many ways that this would grow and expand, I probably wouldn't have had the courage to jump in, which is also a, an important leadership learning. Um, when we started, we thought about it very simply. Relationships follow a pattern. We can create a small set of tools, a, a language and make it available. And, and it's like a, we were thinking about it, what would have helped Yardley. So what movie would she have seen or her friends have seen that made them go, wait a minute, we've got a problem here. That was the goal. It was like, I used to call it domestic violence light, L-I-T-E, because the domestic violence community, which is a very robust one, there's another question about that, has been rightly and appropriately focused on um, the structural pieces of our world that enabled violence to continue and abuse to continue. We were, we were looking for something that was just a, a dose, like a dose that could help you, a dose that could help you. We were really looking for almost like the first aid kit, not we weren't looking to like do surgery on the body we were looking for a first aid kit. Um, in every way, I am sure that that was partly because we were coming to this as a, an organization of white, privileged, hetero, cis, normal people, you know, th that was our profile. So we don't, we weren't as sensitive to some of these underlying pinnings, right? And, and I'm, not, I'm not proud of that. I'm not, but I think it's important to be honest around these conversations and where you have learned to really say, and then as we started working in community, we learned that we needed to go deeper. And so I think the, um, well, I don't think we necessarily need to be the quote unquote experts in like solving the structural problems of our society. We, because other groups are there who are deeper in this we do need to leverage their knowledge and figure out how to bring it in front of the kids we serve. Um, so we can still deliver a first aid kit, but have it also have, and if you wanna learn this and this and this, here's where you go. Um, and I think that really goes, and we can acknowledge, I think just as a, and I'm not, I'm not being overly, um, I don't wanna be, I wanna be really careful here. I'm not being overly simplistic, but I do think there's a benefit to the first aid kit. Um, so that, that first aid kit is our real focus, but we have grown up a lot as an organization and understanding the ties to um, a lot of the structural challenges in our, in our world. Um, what have, and I think you, you just sort of hinted on this, you just sort of touched on this a bit, and I, this was a question I had too, that when working with the other nonprofits, have you met resistance with any of the other organizations? Sort of, how do you um, sort of get, get their trust that you are not trying to suggest that they're not doing things well or that you're trying to take over their space? How do you earn that? How do you sort of- It's so, it's so- First of all, it's not just in domestic violence. This was my experience in Parkinson's too. Any place where funding is challenging or not certain, uh, people get really nervous about new entrants um, or just other organizations in general. So a uh, couple things. I think that it takes time. Um, so it is about building trust. It is about building relationships. It's finding ways to lift their work visibly. Um, I think the fact that we've invested millions of dollars in these tools and we'll continue to do so. And then we make it available for them to use. And we don't, they don't, all they have to say is we partner with One Love and then they can go use it in the schools and we're not trying to butt them out of anywhere. We're just trying to raise the bar on how we teach and get us all with this, the same language. I mean, at first people can be, um, people have said to me in meetings, like we've been doing this, why are you here? Um, and what it takes is over time, they'll eventually come back and say, you know, your stuff is higher quality than what we, we haven't had the budget. You know, they're running hotlines and they're running, they're doing support services and their resources are just going a different direction. So it has, it's trust building, it's being willing to lift other people up. It's not charging for our product. It's, you know, that the, all of those are parts of our strategy. I have a sm slight follow-up question for that. Um, Cause you were talking about kind of the Michael J. Fox Foundation as well. How was it starting or coming from the Michael J. Fox Foundation that developed into such a huge organization and switching to a smaller brand new one like One Love um, in terms of like seed funding and investors and switching from kind of people reaching out to you to want to help then to you having to reach out to people to like educate them on what this new organization is and how they could get involved. Yeah, it was a lot of people did not understand my career move um, from, from running like a $40 million a year organization to, as my husband put it, you don't even know where your next dollar is coming from, was, it, was his really supportive, he's a very supportive husband, but he was like, I'm confused. Um, uh, 
in every way, it's been wildly different. When Michael J. Fox, and, and when I said like jumping off the track, it was a little bit risky to go to Michael J. Fox, except it was Michael J. Fox. And at that point in time, he was the most trusted celebrity in the entire world. So uh, that sort of like insulates the risk a little bit. Um, anyone, we could get meetings with anyone. I mean, you know, Michael and I'd love to come meet to talk to you about XYZ. You know, he's on, if we wanted to get on TV, he would just be like, hi, you know, George Stephanopoulos. I'm making this up a little bit, but hi, I'd love to come on TV and talk about what we're doing. I mean, it's not that simple, but he had a lot of access. And as, because he was this trusted guy, as he went out there, I mean, he was diagnosed when he was 29 years old and he didn't come public, I think until he was about 39. But when he came public, he did more to reduce the shame around Parkinson's disease than I think anybody had done to date. So all of a sudden, when you were diagnosed with Parkinson's, your first thought is Michael J. Fox has this. So then you would go home and you'd Google and you'd find the foundation. So in every way, it was easier for people to find us and get involved. And what I will say about him, he always had the highest bar about what the quality of our work needed to be. And um, he's one of the best human beings I've ever worked with because it, there was he didn't take any of that for granted. And I do, I do think what they've created is amazing. Um, with One Love, nobody had any idea who we were. I mean, like UVA knew who we were and lacrosse people knew who we were, um, but we didn't, we had to go sell. I mean, it's been much more like, I said to somebody a few years ago, like I now know what it would be like to be uh, running for office because my platform is one love and I'm basically running around selling this platform over and over and over again. Um, we've really relied on converting people and then having them introduce us to, I always say, don't introduce me to everybody, you know, think of the one or two people in your network that you think would really have a heart for this. And it's really grown that way with friends, bringing friends into the fold. Um, so it's been radically different. There's, but I do think all my experience at Fox in building that organization gave me the confidence to take this on because I'd already built something and figured it out as we went along. So I guess that's how I would answer that question. Uh, we got two really good questions that are from Jenny Zenner who that are a little bit different. Well, they're definitely different, but I think they're both, they're both really interesting. One is um, how, and, how you and your staff, and I was even thinking about Yardley's mom, like how you sort of process all the trauma that's inherent with your work. Um, and then the, her related question is what are some of the breakthroughs and what does One Love need for our, its next breakthrough? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, I don't have a good answer for the first one. I think people are very different in how they process trauma. I know um, in the first, I think that, um, it has been harder for some of our employees than others. We've definitely had people end up who love One Love but leave because the toll is too high in terms of doing this work and being in it all the time. I happen to be a person that um, I could never do direct service work. I could never work at a women's shelter. It would not be possible for me. I'm a total, I, I would just absorb all of it and it would not be good for me. But in getting upstream, I feel like I'm part of the solution. And so I am. A, I have a buffer up for some reason, which doesn't mean that I don't hear traumatic stories or help counsel people through things and get them to the resources they need. But I couldn't do that if that was my full-time job. And here I feel like my full-time job is something else. Um, we, a lot of, a lot of us uh, see counselors, some have started meditating, like anything you can do to develop a practice that helps you release some of the trauma is super important. And even just understanding trauma more than we, we start, again, that's another example of something we didn't really think about when we started, but we've become much more informed around as we've got, as we've grown. Um, in terms of breakthroughs for One Love, I mean, I think, I would say um, the 10 signs as a framework as the language and the backbone and this vision of like, oh, we are going to tell many people's stories. And actually, we're not going to tell them. We're going to go to them to tell the stories, but we're going to teach them about the 10 signs first so they can show us how these 10 signs show up in their stories. That is such an important organizing principle for this work that we have a language that we're trying to teach every kid. I also think that we are just beginning. Um, this summer, we had a One Love Student Summit. It was supposed to be at UVA, actually. It was going to be held at UVA. It was the inaugural um, youth summit. We had to do it virtually, and we did it over four days by Zoom. It was incredible. And I, what I mean by that is, I think this bet we're going to make on investing in young people and then 
empowering them to go do the work. I think it's going to pay off. We're still, we're still making the investment now, but just the energy was like palpable. So what, what's it going to take for us to get to the next level? Um, so I always say to people that, well, there, I have so many ideas swirling through my head. Um, I always say to people that once people know us, they tend to love us, but we can't meet people fast enough. So we've talked a lot about the need to raise the profile of the organization, however that might be. I don't want to do it in an authentic way, like through some paid celebrity partnership or something like that, because authenticity is sort of at the core of what we're trying to create here. But a higher profile where people could find us more easily, like what I described at Michael J. Fox, that would be incredible. So we're hoping that this new Love is Learned campaign will establish that love is something you can learn and one loves where you go to learn. And we're hopeful that we'll get a lot of coverage through that. But to be honest, we live in a world where there's so much noise that it's really, really hard. So um, if, if like an amazing uh, person with a connection to this issue and who had millions of followers came forward and started tweeting about us or sharing on Instagram in an authentic way, that would be a game changer for us because we've built everything here for mass participation, but it's about how do you get the people to the website. So um, I do think also when we have, like I think in the next 24 months, we will have at four to six new films that are more diverse in their perspectives, but anchored to the 10 signs. I think that's gonna be a game changer too. I think it'll be the first sign, really clear sign to the world that we're deadly serious about this move into an organization centered around all. Um, and I think it's really gonna help us with public school engagement. So I don't know why my phone's going off. Sorry. Um, so that would be my answer, those two things. And then in terms of how people can help, I mean, obviously, so we love people who support us financially because we're one, one person at a time has funded this thing. Um, we also love volunteers. We're building more and more volunteer programs, both at the student level um, and at the adult level. I would really highly, if everybody just took a look at the One Love Education Center today and thought, hmm, I wonder who could use this in my life. You can, you can introduce friends to it. It's really designed to be for all. Um, and our hope is that you get trained and you take it to other people. But even if you learn it, just if you use it just to teach yourself, so that you're better empowered, I think that that's a great thing too. So I guess that's what I would say. I think your um, I think that brings us exactly to the end of our of our session. I don't see. I think you. I think we've got through gotten through all the questions. Martha, did you have anything else? No, I think that's it. I just want to say to all the people attending, anyone in the Baton community, if any students or anyone else wants to get involved in One Love's mission at UVA, to please email me. I'll put my email in the in the chat, but we have a really great group at UVA that works really hard and um, we always are looking for more people if anyone wants to join and um, yeah and thank you so much to Katie for coming. This has been incredible and I always love hearing you speak so this has been so great and yeah, thank you so much. I loved it. Thank you guys and thanks for all the good questions. Yes, Katie, thank you so much. We are, you inspired, I know you definitely inspired me both through your own path and also the work that you're currently doing and and I know other people feel the same way. So we're really thankful for you. And um, like I said, it's just the dose of inspiration that I think a lot of us sort of oh, were looking yeah. for today. Stressing out this week, but <laughs> trying to manage it, trying to manage it. All right, well, thank so We hope we'll have a chance to meet you in person someday. I hope, I hope. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. All right, thanks again. Everyone have a good day.